Hello. Good morning. Good morning. That's just great hearing everybody chat. That's nice. Welcome, everyone. It's good to have everyone here. Welcome to any visitors. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Welcome to anyone who's joining us online for the first or maybe for the 31st time. Uh, welcome to you as well. Um, I'm going to go through the announcements first. Did anyone get a bulletin? Anyone need a bulletin? We're all good with the bulletin. Okay. So, well, let me see. We have a memorial service this afternoon at 3 for Muriel. So anyone who is interested, you need to take the 2 o'clock ferry to attend that. And we pray for Muriel's family and her friends that have lost her as a friend and family member. Uh, you can see there's a church board meeting. Uh, nominations. There are nomination papers in the back of the church that you can pick up. Anyone can nominate anyone. So grab a nomination sheet and uh, nominate for the positions available. And if you have questions, I think you can ask Alex about that. Uh, we have our Utsa Lake Bible Camp fundraiser auction and dinner. Finally, after how many years, this is really fun. So it is on November 5th, which is a Saturday. Um, I will be at the church on Friday, let's say from noon on, that you can drop off items. We want new or like new items only. And um, there's always a nice variety of items. And so uh, we ask that you bring things and then plan to come. I, don't, I guess tickets will be available ahead of, t ahead of time, yes. And it's always a really fun time just to visit. And everybody needs more stuff in their house, right? <laughs> and if you don't, we're more than happy just to take dollars. Just, you know, you don't have to take anything home. But anyways, there's lots of baking. There's lots of uh, fun items to bid on and just a fun time to visit. So plan and put that on your calendar for sure. The ladies' meeting is actually Monday, November 21st at 7 at Marion's house. So that is the announcements for today. I um, just realized I should have got a little stand. Oh, well. Uh, okay, here we go. <coughs> you know how I love object lessons. Uh, we're talking a little bit today about just um, light and uh, light to a dark world. And... Um, so I brought some examples of lights because I, I knew that you would want to see them. So uh, I'm going to start with something that's quite high tech. It's a, it's a headlamp, but it's a headlamp that is rechargeable. So you can plug it in. And uh, this headlamp, it's not going to work because it's too bright in here. Uh, if it was darker, it would work. But this headlamp, in, you know, if you're out skiing or hiking in the evening and you want to know what the top of a tree looks like, this headlamp will do it for you. You can, I mean, it shines, you know, a good 50 feet, 100 feet, I don't know how far it goes, but it's a very, very cool lamp and being rechargeable, very handy. So this is kind of like in the, the high tech category. And then we have one that's a, kind of a regular little old flashlight, but you know, it, like who doesn't need a telescoping one? And if you can't see around that corner, see, it bends. So this is, this is kind of high tech too. And then I have one that, um, I don't know how many of you would have seen something like this before, but when I was a teenager, well, actually, when I was a kid, I grew up with a, my, one of my best, my best friend's father was a trapper. And so he taught us how to make these things called bugs. Now, I, I'm going to have to put my mic down because I forgot to get a stand. So just give me one sec. So, this is a very simple little contraption. It's a, can, it's a tin. You drill through it, hang a little wire so you can hold on to it. It's got a, a one candle power. Isn't that what they used to call it in the olden days? One candle power. And you would be amazed. I tried it again last night just so that I wouldn't be telling you guys a tall tale. But I, I let me see, you know, like, hang on. I, I'll try it on the, on the wall here. And so this little bug light uh, is actually kind of a cool little light. You know, everybody's going to want to build one of these this afternoon, aren't you? It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, this little light mine or something? Yes, something like that. Anyways, this is called a bug, and it, and it works pretty good. You can, you know, and you keep it in your trapper's cabin. Oh, Doris has got a light, too. 
Oh, that is, oh, Doris, show everyone Doris. Doris has a cane <laughs> that has a light in it. Why didn't I ask Doris ahead of time if I could have used that one as well? <laughs> Anyways, the one candle power is a pretty trick little light. So this, of course, got me thinking about light in general. And um, John 8, 12 says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So when Jesus' followers reflect the light of Jesus, because we don't have that light in us on our own, we reflect his light to the world, then we become the light of the world. Like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So the kind of lamp that they're talking about there, speaking of different kinds of light, was the little clay lamp, and it had olive oil in it, and it was lit by drawing up the oil through a wick. Pretty low tech. Um, so we have clay lamps, we have flashlights, high tech ones, kind of basic ones. We have something as simple as a little can with a candle in it. They all produce light. They all reflect that light. And like us, we can all reflect God's love in different ways to the world. Um, and no matter what kind of light we are, we can be used by God. And some of us might think, oh, I'm not, I'm not high tech enough. I, you know, I don't have the skills, or, I, or like Moses, you know, I'm just, I'm not good with words. But there are so many ways that we can show the light of God to the world. And don't try to be a different light than you are. I mean, God created us all uniquely and differently for a reason. Um, and so we have an opportunity to re reflect God's light in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our businesses in town, so many places. Let your light shine before men so we can show grace and we can show kindness, we can show patience, love, mercy, forgiveness, peace. All those things can be reflected as Jesus, as we allow Jesus to use us and reflect his light. We live in a world of, full of hurting people and who need a savior and who need to see that light. So I'll just pray now that we each can be that light that he has created us to be. Let's open in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for your light, for your life in our lives. We are nothing without you, and we recognize fully that as we commit our lives to you, that you will use us in special ways. And I pray for each one here, each one listening in, that you would um, give us a renewed sense of being that light in our communities, in our, our workplaces, in our homes, in our places where we interact with people that we could reflect your light. And uh, I pray that you give us strength, give us courage, and bring those opportunities to, to each of us each and every day. Pray for people who aren't able to be here due to illness or some are hurting, some are, are grieving right now. I pray, God, that you would fill their rooms with your presence and your love and your light. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And the worship team will come. Good morning. I would uh, invite you to stand as we uh, sing some songs to God. And uh, since we are talking about the light, well, the first song doesn't doesn't mention it, but um, but we do have some songs in that uh, in, in that area. We believe in God the Father, maker of the universe, and in Christ, the Son, our Savior, come to us by virgin birth. We believe He died to save us, for our sins was crucified, then from death He rose Lord of all, Lord of all. 
with gifts of power. God is word of truth affirming, says us to the nations now. They will come again in glory, judge the living and the dead. Every knee shall bow before him, then must every tongue
light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for the sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. talking about the light. You just can't talk about the light without digging this song out. <laughs> Bye. 
the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, shine me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. So our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirror here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this man with the Father. forth the word, Lord, and let there be light. Thank you for your singing and your clapping. <laughs> I was hoping someone would do that. <laughs> I know that there's uh, a children's ministry um, child care schedule being worked on. Is it ready for this Sunday? No. Okay. Uh, it will be soon coming. And uh, so um, we will hopefully have that for you. Yes. Oh, okay. So if you didn't hear that, there is a, a memory verse and a coloring sheet in the back of the church for some of the older kids. So someone like you, Jude, if you want to work on something like that, uh, that would be fantastic. Did you get one already? Yeah, right on. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for leading us in those songs. And yeah, um, shine, Jesus, shine. Let's... Uh, Let's pray. Father, as we have seen already just reflected in the service, uh, you are the light, and your light is reflected in us. And I pray, Father, that it will be uh, reflected more and more profoundly, and that we would understand that light that you've given to us, and that you are. Um, Father, open up your word. Shine the light of your word into our, light, into our lives as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Autumn is a, an, a spectacular season, uh, especially this past year. Um, there has just been so many times where uh, you go walking and it, I'm just so amazed at the colors. And when it comes with the sunshine, this picture was taken uh, down at Francois Lake, just walking past uh, St. Luke's, between uh, St. Luke's and just heading um, east. And, uh, and just so many vibrant colors. Uh, there's the crisp air, the morning fog, the harvesting of gardens. There's so much to like about autumn. <clears throat> but it seems to me that there's another side as well that maybe some of us struggle with, at least uh, I know I do, and that is the way that the days are also getting shorter this time of year. And, you know, I, it's just like every day. It's like, wow, it's that much shorter again, and, uh, and it just seems like you used to enjoy going out for walks after supper, and there was lots of time for that. Now, my goodness, if you don't get out before supper, it's 
too late, and it's just not going to happen. And, uh, and I think some people really actually, not just uh, are a little sad about it, but some people actually get depressed about it. And there is such a condition as uh, a seasonal affective disorder that, uh, that really weighs on people. And in, so it's not surprising that in many ways, um, just that we prefer light over darkness, and it's that we see this light and darkness being used symbolically in literature, in stories, and also in the Bible. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, the, the classic Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. And there's one scene in particular that when I think of light and darkness, I think of this scene where uh, it's in the second book, The Two Towers, and, and it's the, 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 last, the, the battle in Helm's Deep. And there's, the night is growing and it's getting darker and darker and there's this army of orcs that are marching down and uh, coming against Theoden, who's the king of Rohan, and him and just a ragtag rag uh, band of army are going to try to hold them off. And as the night gets, progresses and it gets darker, they get pushed further and further back into the keep, into, the, um, into their fortress. Until finally, just before dawn, Aragorn and Theoden say, let's, okay, uh, let's ride out. Let's not be trapped in this place anymore. Let's uh, go out and meet the darkness. And so just before dawn, a few sturdy knights on their horses ride out into this sea of orcs that looks like it's an impossible mission, a uh, suicide mission. But just as they ride out, the sun begins to rise. And there in the rising sun is Gandalf and uh, leading a cavalry of Rohan riders who come marching or riding down the hill and, and suddenly the, um, you go from darkness to light, from despair to hope. And it's just like, you know, it's one of these classic scenes in a story that just reflects the way that we often think about light and darkness. Light speaks of hope and possibilities and joy. Darkness speaks of fear and uncertainty. <clears throat> and in the text that we're going to be looking at this morning in Isaiah, the prophet contrasts the growing darkness that is starting to envelop uh, the people of Judah, and it's just getting darker and darker, it seems, with the promise of new light, a new dawn that will come in the, sometime in the future. And the light that the prophet sees in the future is in fact the coming of the good news, the coming of the gospel. And so again we see the gospel being reflected here in the book of Isaiah. <coughs> but before we get to the light, we need to take a look at the darkness that Isaiah and his people were, were facing and experience a little bit of that darkness. And, I, and as we see how they respond to the darkness around them, I think you'll also find that there are similarities to the way that people respond to the growing darkness around us as well. So last week, we saw how King Ahaz in Isaiah 7 was at a crossroads between faith and fear. The prophet tells Ahaz, hang in there. You need to just sit still and trust the Lord. He will deliver you. But instead, Ahaz is tempted to take matters into his own hands, which he does. He makes this alliance with the Assyrian uh, king, and it plunges the nation into deeper darkness. And now, as the nation is facing this uncertainty, in chapter 8, we see two different ways that, that the people of Judah are responding to the growing darkness. First of all, <clears throat> they're looking over their shoulders behind them in fear. They're fearfully looking over their shoulders. When people are afraid, they often look to conspiracy movements to help them make sense of the confusion and the uncertainty that they are experiencing. <clears throat> Let's read Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11 to 13. This is what the Lord says, says to me and with his strong hand upon me, Isaiah is speaking here, warning me not to follow the way of this people, uh, 
another translation, another way of putting it would be, warning me not to think the way that the people think. And then in verse 12, do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. For the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. I remember reading this about a year ago. I was uh, somewhere around there. I was reading through the book of Isaiah, and these verses just kind of popped off the page to me. It's just like, you know, in our time right now, there's so much uncertainty, and, and in the midst of all of that uncertainty, people are turning more and more to the different conspiracy movements. Uh, We look for hidden agendas, conspiracies about right-wing or left-wing agendas, conspiracies about stolen elections, conspiracies about agendas of the rich or the the, the elite in society. And so the fact is that conspiracies thrive in a climate of uncertainty. It thrives in a climate of uncertainty. And when it feels like the world is spinning out of control, people are looking for hidden insights that help them make sense of what's going on. And, but here's, here's the thing about conspiracies. Conspiracies grow and are fed by our fear. And conspiracies lead to more fear. They're fed by fear, but then they lead to more fear. And so it just becomes a bit of a, um, a circle, a, a vicious circle. And then you read a verse like this. Do not call conspiracy everything that this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread what they dread. When I read this, it just, it felt like a a word custom made for our time and age. And uh, and it's a word that was apparently also custom made for Isaiah's time as well. But this is what the people of God need to understand and what you and I also need to understand. There is no agenda, whether hidden or revealed, that will usurp or undo the purpose and the plan of God. God's purpose will remain strong. It will remain true. And there is no hidden agenda that will derail it. Confidence doesn't come from trying to uncover hidden agendas. It comes from walking in holy fear and reverence to the Lord who is in charge, who is the God of history and will bring the beginning and the end, who knows the beginning and the end. And so this is what the people need to understand. In times of darkness, people often look back over their shoulders looking for some sort of uh, hidden meaning to what's going on when what they need to be looking at is the Lord of history. The second sign of this growing darkness, this response to the darkness, is fearfully looking ahead, speculating on the future apart from God. Picking it up from verse 19, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, Should not a people inquire of God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Then they, down to verse 22, then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. In the face of uncertainty, in the face of growing darkness, the people of Israel were so afraid that they're turning to the occult, to the spirit world for hidden insights about what's, what the future might hold. And this is God's people. And Isaiah says to them, should you not inquire of God instead? <clears throat> Isn't that where you're supposed to turn? Should they not turn to God's instruction, his warnings, the testimony of his word? This is what they should be doing, but instead they've been turning to the occult, to the spirit world for these insights. And the result is that they 
are, their darkness is growing darker and darker because they're looking for light in the wrong place. They will see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness, the prophet says. It's a picture of darkness that grows heavier and heavier and heavier. <clears throat> now, I know that there continues to be, even to this day, people who turn to the occult, to horoscopes, to Ouija boards, and all manner of uh, different sorts of things that, uh, that they go to to look for help. <clears throat> to understand what, what the future will bring. But among God's people, I hope it's not the case, that that's not where we would go. Uh, nevertheless, I think there are ways where we maybe also try to fearfully anticipate and speculate and look to the future on things apart from God. I was pondering these verses and thinking, well, what does it have to say to us? <clears throat> and, uh, and one of the thoughts that came to mind is how there's been a shift, I think, in the way people go looking to the news. You know, it used to be that the news was primarily about reporting about things that have happened. <clears throat> and back when, <laughs> when the news primarily came through newspapers, it was, you know, looking back on the week's events and reporting on those things. But as we become more and more connected through the internet and, and uh, all of these different things, our expectation has changed. We don't want to just know what's happened last week. We want to know what's happening right now as it unfolds. Show it to me, you know, tell me what's going on. And then it's not a step too much farther from there to say, <clears throat> I don't want to just know what's happening right now. I want to know what will happen. And we expect the news <coughs> to, uh, to speculate about what will happen, even before it does. And so, for example, I did a quick survey of, uh, of YouTube head news headlines on Ukraine and Russia. And there's you know, a variety of uh, reports. Some of them are about events that took place, but a lot of them are just pure speculation. Uh, here's a f some examples of headlines. How close is Putin to a nuclear strike? You know, that's a question that we all want to know, and, and we want somebody to tell us what will happen. <clears throat> Senator predicts a wild few weeks in Ukraine fighting ahead. What would happen if Russia and the U.S. went to war? Another headline. Retired general predicts what comes next in Ukraine. This isn't just news anymore. This is trying to predict the future, trying to speculate. And now there's a place to, <coughs> to, be, to anticipate the, what's going to come down the road, but uh, so often our speculation actually is only leading us to more fear. And that's, I think, what's happening here. Uh, speculation leads to more fear and more worry. So let me just reiterate what the prophet Isaiah says. <clears throat> should not a people inquire of their God? That's where we should be turning. Consult God's instruction, the testimony of his warning. If anyone does not speak according to his word, they have no light of dawn. First and foremost, we turn to the Word of God. We should be rooted in the Word of God. That's where the truth is found. <clears throat> and that's where confidence comes from. It doesn't come from trying to figure out what's going to happen next. <clears throat> Whether things, events are going to be hard or good, fact is God is still in control, and so we need to turn to the Lord. And so in chapter 8, we see this growing darkness and how the people are responding fearfully by looking back over their shoulders or fe responding fearfully by trying to speculate about the future apart from God. <clears throat> but then in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet points to a light in the distance. In Isaiah chapter 9, beginning of verse 1, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And those were the two tribes that were furthest north in Israel. They would have been the first tribes to be sent into exile. Now they're going to be the first tribes to see hope. If 
future hope. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations <clears throat> by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Almost feels like we're already into Advent season as we <laughs> look at Isaiah because we're kind of looking at these classic Christmas texts. Um, the word used here for deep darkness is the same word used in Psalm 23, the shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death. That's the same word <clears throat> that's used here. People are in this valley of the shadow of death, this deep darkness. But now, a light is dawning. There's light in the horizon that gives hope. And so what is the source <clears throat> of this new hope, this light in the dark, deep darkness? Well, it's not so much a what, it's a who. Who is this light? Verse 6 continues, go down a few verses. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. I find it interesting how in Isaiah, uh, so many of the prophecies are connected to the birth of a child. Back in chapter 7, we read how Ahaz would be given a sign. There was going to be a child that would be born, and he would be known as Emmanuel. <clears throat> and ultimately, that prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus. At the beginning of chapter 8, there is, uh, Isaiah is told that he was to name his son... Mehar Shalal Hashbaz. I don't know if any of you are expecting a son. Maybe you might want to consider this name. Mehar Shalal Hashbaz. It means quick to, ponder, sorry, quick to plunder. And his sign was a birth to Ahaz that very soon the people were going to be plundered. Or the people of uh, Syria and, and Israel would be plundered. <clears throat> and now in chapter 9, another child will be born. And his birth will bring light to, from the darkness. His coming will bring justice and righteousness, and God's peop the righteousness that God's people so desperately need. And listen to the name of this child. <clears throat> These are titles, not necessarily the name that people would call him, but just this is... The, uh, so often in, uh, in the Hebrews, among the Hebrews, they would name a child based on the kinds of uh, experiences that they had. And he will be called, this child will be called, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. <clears throat> Obviously, this is no ordinary child. He will bring the presence of God to his people he will bring light. He will fulfill the hopes and dreams of the people of God. Wonderful counselor speaks of divine wisdom and insight. We often think of counselors as being maybe somebody who you go to in times of trouble and uh, discouragement. In uh, biblical times, a counselor was more someone that the king would go to for advice and wisdom as to how to rule. <clears throat> and this, count, this child would be known as Wonder Counselor, Wonderful Counselor. And we see the wisdom in Jesus when he came. You know, even as a young child, uh, remember the time described in the Gospel of Luke, how uh, he went to the temple, he was uh, about 12 years old, and he ends up staying behind and he's discussing theology with Israel's leading teachers, their scholars, the masters. <coughs> but... This young boy is schooling the masters. And everyone, it says in Luke chapter 2, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Already as just a young boy. Later, Jesus became renowned as a master teacher. Mark writes that the people were so amazed at Jesus that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. <coughs> his teaching was so much different than the rest. John chapter 3, verse 34 says, For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. He is wonderful counselor. He is also called mighty God. 
literally warrior god. <clears throat> this speaks of victory, of power, uh, one who defeats his enemies. Maybe that's not the way that we typically think about Jesus. But w- when you stop to think of it, yeah, he is exactly that. <clears throat> you know, that there was a sense in which the people wanted him to lead armies and to lead a rebellion against the Romans. But instead, what he did is he came to disarm the powers and the authorities of this dark world and to conquer them, triumph over them through the cross. Jesus came to conquer death, which he did through his resurrection. He came to free people from the captivity of sin and darkness. He is our mighty warrior, our warrior God, victorious. He is also everlasting Father. In other words, his fatherhood will last for eternity. John chapter 1, verse 12, gives us this promise that whoever believes in him, or sorry, whoever received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Through Jesus, we are adopted into the family of God. We become sons and daughters of God, and he is our Father everlasting, our everlasting Father. <clears throat> and lastly, he is the Prince of Peace. Darkness brings uncertainty, <clears throat> unrest, Jesus brings shalom. He brings peace and rest. Jesus says to the crowd, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. You know, it's amazing how the best minds in the world have a difficult time anticipating what's going to happen seven months down the road, or seven weeks down the road, or even maybe seven days down the road. But here, Isaiah, the Lord speaking through Isaiah, is anticipating what's going to happen 700 years down the road when Jesus would be born. And this child, the prophet said, will reign on David's throne over the, and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. <clears throat> and the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The, the, the drive, the passion... The zeal of God Almighty is going to make sure that this will happen. As I've done in my previous messages in in Isaiah, I want to bring about a a story to try to encapsulate uh, this promise of light, this promise of hope in the midst of darkness. And the testimony today is not a salvation story. It's, It's about a couple... Mark and Martha, who learned to treasure life and find hope in the midst of a dark diagnosis. Mark is diagnosed with um, ALS. It's a terminal disease that attacks the nervous system. And eventually it, uh, it starts to shut down the muscles, which mean that you can't walk. Uh, you can't start moving. You, eventually you become paralyzed. It, if you can't swallow. You can't... Um, do all the, the things that you normally would do, and ultimately you can't breathe. And that's what leads to death. And this um, the story is from a book by Tim Keller called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. And it's stories from people in his congregation. And let me just uh, read it for you. <clears throat> it's... It's written by both Martha and Mark, and so I'll just kind of say their name and so that you know which voice is speaking at this time. Martha. As my husband Mark sits in his wheelchair, unable to move, unable to move anything but his eyes, and that becoming increasingly difficult, we are approaching the 10-year point in our journey. It began with a small muscle twitch when Mark was 48 years old, and within a month, our doctor diagnosed the cause as the terminal illness, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. We had been married 25 years and had four children. We had always been an active family, so Mark's quick physical demise was devastating. When Mark got sick, I fell into a black hole of despair. I didn't know how I was going to live through the pain 
of the coming days. I asked my, all my friends to pray that the fear of tomorrow would not rob me of the joy of today <clears throat> because I was struggling. I wondered, who am I if not Mark's wife? Today I understand the idolatry in that statement and why this despair was so deep. I had identified most deeply with Mark as my husband and provider. In my eyes, I had put him before God. How I moved from despair is a mystery. I had no answer, or sorry, I had no awareness of being called forth. <coughs> Yet I experienced a sense of resurrection. During those early days, Mark and I quoted every verse we could think of about God's care. We atten attempted to, <coughs> excuse me, we attempted to find ways to beat into our hearts and love and faith, the, the love and faithfulness of God. We planted our feet in the truth and understood, even though everything in our lives seemed to say else otherwise. Now this is Mark writing, and he's, <laughs> interestingly, it says, he's used, he uses a computer, and he uh, basically, through the computer, and with his eyes, somehow he is able to type <clears throat> out the message that he, he wants to type. And this is what he says. I played sports in my younger years, and I always hated sitting on the bench. One day, just after my diagnosis, I cried out to God that I thought I was being pulled out of the game when I still had something to offer. <clears throat> his response was, you have been on the sidelines for some time, and now... You are just now going into the game, hanging on to the truth that God is doing much that I can't see and that in his economy it is worth the suffering. But, but it is also a daily exercise of faith. The body of Christ moved into our lives in a very tangible way. Friends helped with meals, gave gift cards, did yard work, planned birthday parties for our kids, <clears throat> came and were just presents. Even 10 years into the journey, we still have many people reaching out to us with support and strength and love. That's the body of Christ reflecting the light. Martha. There were so many things at the beginning that I didn't think I could live through emotionally. One of those was picking a burial place for Mark. <clears throat> My daughters and I went one day to find a place there was a tenderness between us and even laughter. <coughs> I sensed God saying to me, I'm here in all those places you don't think you'll ever be able to face. I will be there. It was a day of significance in sensing his presence with me, not just that day, but for everything that lay ahead. Mark, I found that singing hymns and African-American spirituals in my head <clears throat> because I've not been able to, because I've been not been able to speak for the last eight years, has been helpful. Many hymns are about suffering and speak deeply to my need for a sense of His presence with me in the midst of pain. These hymns are a treasure that modern Christian music don't even approach. Some of the best reminders th that this world and its troubles, some of the best reminders that this world and its troubles is not our home. Recently, I've been diagnosed with a terminal liver disease. <clears throat> Sometimes I say that I'm un unfairly suffering, but then the only one who went through suffering unfairly was Jesus. His separation from the Father on the cross is far beyond anything I could ever experience. How can I complain when, I went through the cosmic pain, when he went through that cosmic pain for me? I remember Tim Keller relating a story of a man <clears throat> who was terminally ill and who, would, who told him that the sweetness of his life with God as a result of his illness, he would not trade for more years. I have found that to be true in my life as well. Martha, we have found meaning, purpose, joy, growth, and wholeness in our loss. How much I would have missed if I had opted out of this season. God has had so much to give me in the midst of it. 
I see how intense sorrow and intense sweetness are mingled together. The depth and richness of life have come in suffering. How much I have learned and how much sweeter Jesus is now to me. It's so easy to get lost in, uh, in pain, to get lost in darkness. <clears throat> but he's, Jesus is there for you. He is the light in the darkness. Darkness comes to us in different ways. It can come in the form of guilt. But in Jesus, there's forgiveness. There's new beginning. There's hope. In uh, John chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship, or we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Darkness can come in the form of fear and uncertainty, <clears throat> fear of the future. But Jesus reminds us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. John chapter 16, verse 33. He is our certainty. He's our victory in times of uncertainty. Darkness threatens those who lose people that they love, people that they couldn't imagine living without. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Even death can separate us from the light of Jesus. Some people like... <clears throat> Mark and Martha face disease that threatens to overwhelm them like a dark cloud. But Jesus responds, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, the thing I realize going through all of these verses is that Jesus doesn't promise to remove all the darkness from our lives. That's not what it's about. <clears throat> there will be a day, I suppose, when he comes again, when that will happen. But right now, we still live with, a, with darkness around us. But right now, in whatever you're facing, he brings light, he brings confidence, he brings hope in the midst of darkness. And so Jesus said, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Do you believe that? I have come into the world as a light, so that no one... Who believes in me should should stay in darkness it's time for us to walk in the light and that's the good news of the gospel he brings light it's time for us to be that people of light that reflect his light to others the people walking in darkness have seen a great light and on those living in the land of deep darkness a light has dawned and his name is Jesus Let's close uh, with a, a song, please. I invite you to stand as we uh, as we sing the song "Send the Light." There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed Let it shine from 
at the last moment I was going to quickly look up a verse but then the verse ended <laughs> anyways let's uh, let's close in prayer <clears throat> father thank you for sending Jesus into the world thank you that we see Jesus not just as a distant hope and hoping for the day that he will come he has come and he has brought light and so, Father, we just pray that you will give us the strength, the confidence, and the assurance of walking in that light. I pray for those who are struggling right now with, uh, with uncertainty, with fear, with guilt, with so many different things. Lord, may the light of your love shine in our hearts and bring us hope and grace. And now as we go from here, bless us and keep us, and may your face shine upon us and give us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.